If I asked you to recite John 3.16, you probably could, couldn't you? Verbatim, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It has been called the gospel in a nutshell. If you want to know what the good news of salvation is, there you go. And in fact, it has become so well known a verse that much like the 23rd Psalm, you cannot think of it outside of the King James. Uh, if you have ever heard a, a more modern, um, still faithful, but modern translation of the Lord is my shepherd, I shall want for nothing. It doesn't, it sets the teeth on edge. We're so used to hearing, I shall not want. There's, there's that Shakespearean Elizabethan poetry to it. It's just become so ingrained not only in our minds, but in the minds of the world, non-believers. I have previously talked about all of the places in the culture that John 3.16 pops up, and they are myriad and they are strange. I always talk about placards at football games, right? Somebody holding up, it just says John 3.16, no context, no, you're just supposed to know it, or you're supposed to go and find it. I talked about Tim Tebow. I'm not a football guy, but uh, Tim Tebow, who... Uh, put under his sunblocker during a particular game, it said John under one eye and 316 under the other, and then someone after that particular game, might have even been a Super Bowl game, um, did some internet sleuthing and noted the rise in Google searches of people who saw that on Tim Tebow's face and then went, what's John 316? And typed that in. You find it on coffee cups for fast food places uh, in the United States, bumper stickers, uh, from blimps, balloons, everything, t-shirts, John 3.16, John 3.16, John 3.16. And I have several times said, it amazes me that an unbelieving world in the grip of darkness and in Satan's thrall can know scripture. So never let someone's ability to quote scripture be the sole hallmark that you say, oh, certainly they're a believer. No, an unbelieving world knows this. At least they know the words, let me clarify that. They know the words, they may even know the chapter, the third chapter, 16th verse, but they do not understand it. And I think that one of the things that we will come to realize as we look at the build-up, John 3.16 is really the conclusion cap on a scene, and I want to look at the scene that precedes it so that we all the better understand the concluding remark of John. So turn with me if you would, if you've got it there, John 3. This is very early, this is very, very early in Christ's earthly ministry. We've had the Sermon on the Mount, we've had the water into wine, you kind of have to kind of piece together the chronology from the four Gospels, but it's still very early, and now John opens, if you remember John 1, John 1 puts the clearing of the temple right at the beginning of his, he starts the Gospel um, in media res, is the, is the cinematic terms. He starts with an action sequence to kind of grab your attention. Um, if you read the other three synoptic gospels, the clearing of the temple, you remember, happens at the beginning of Passover week. And this has led uh, many scholars to think that Jesus m actually cleared the temple twice. That he bookends his ministry by laying claim to his father's house. So it's still very early in the ministry. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He has thrown out the moneylenders. He has begun his teaching and his preaching. He has even performed miraculous signs to to back up what he is saying, and then one night in Jerusalem this happens, John 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same, that's Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit, capital S, is Spirit. 
Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but thou canst not tell where it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou the master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that which we do know, and testify that which we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Lord add his blessing to that reading. So you see, we stopped right before John 3.16 because we're going to take at least two weeks to kind of work its 15 verses, so we're going to divide it up and work our way through it. But this morning I am reminded of a moment of church history and a very towering figure in church history. It was the evangelist George Whitfield, who, and I'm, I'm not sure if the story is uh, apocryphal or not, but I'll, I'll relate it to you anyway, was I believe it was in Boston. Uh, he was preaching all up and down colonial America before the American Revolution, and everywhere he went, his message was, the same at its heart, you must be born again. And we know that he was saying this because as the story goes, a woman finally came up to him and said, Mr. Whitfield, why are you always saying that you must be born again? And George Whitfield, you need to know, he was, not, he was a towering theological figure. He's not, he was not a towering man. He was kind of short and pear-shaped and he had a lazy eye. He was really nothing to look at. But he stared her straight in the face and with all clarity and authority, she said, why, why are you always saying you must be born again? He said, because, dear madam, you must be born again. In other words, what else would I dare tell you? You must be born again. It's the gospel. And it's the gospel that is so desperately needed in a world that is full of faith narratives that insist that you can see the kingdom of heaven, that you can enter the kingdom of heaven, and you don't need to go through the new birth. Well, I mean, when I was a kid, it's kind of fallen out of our Christian vernacular. When I was a kid, we used to identify ourselves as born-again Christians. I didn't really know what that meant because it was 10, but right? I'm a born-again Christian. It was out there. We identified it. I don't know what's happened. We have kind of dropped that from our, from our self-identification as to who we are, but it doesn't change the fact that it is true. If you are here this morning or if you are hearing me recorded this morning, and you profess genuine, salvific faith in Christ, you have been born again. There's no coming into the kingdom. You can't even see the kingdom. And by that, we're going to look at, you can't even understand the kingdom unless you've been born again. All right, so let's start with, what do we mean by this turn of phrase? What does Jesus mean by this turn of phrase? What we're talking about here, and if you're taking notes, write this word down. This is the doctrine of, here's the word, regeneration. Now, if I gave you this verse out of the Pauline epistles, you would all nod and agree and know it. Yes? That if, therefore, if a man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. That is, everything that person was, everything that person did, every outstanding crime or sin that person ever had stacked against them, it is gone. What we're looking at is not a cleaned up version of who you used to be. Every other faith narrative in the world gives you that. It tells you how to put your life in order, or how to, how to grab that golden ring, or whatever else it promises, how to find peace and tranquility and contentment. That is absolutely not what the Christian faith is about. I'm not here to self-help you. I, I'm not here to buoy up your ego. I'm here to remind you, if you are saved, of what you have been saved out of and who you are now. And if you are not yet saved, I am here to implore you with the truth. You cannot, you will not enter, let alone see the kingdom of heaven unless you were born again. You must be regenerated. Now, this is really important. And this is what we do here. We don't, I just 
don't just get up and give you the Bible. I give you the theology that underlies it, and it's not my opinion. This is what the Bible talks about. You are a new creature. You must be completely rebuilt. I've uh, talked about some of the television shows. I, I'm sure you guys have, have seen some variation on this. Uh, builders build a, a dilapidated house. They gut the thing. They rebuild it. It gets a fresh coat of paint. They flip it on the market, and they make a huge profit, and they move on to the next one, right? Love it or leave it. Uh, list it or lump it or anything that Mike Holmes does. You know these shows. You know, you know? They'll buy some rundown shack. They'll renovate it, put an addition on it, fresh coat of paint, new furniture. Then the professional... A uh, real estate person comes in and sets it so it looks like it's a photo shoot out of Better Homes and Gardens, and somebody comes in and goes, well, I guess if it's in Toronto, it's 1.2 million. So, <laughs> or up here, it would be about half a million, whatever it is. That's not what we're talking about. It's not a home reno. It, it's not a personal reno. It's not even a, wow, we really had to strip this down to the bricks and studs and rebuild it from the ground up. No. The new birth... Spiritual regeneration is, a, it's not, get rid of all of that in your mind. It is not a rebuilding. It is not a refreshing. It is a completely new thing. Now, it is built, as one Puritan writer said, it is a new thing built on old ground. So if you want to think about in terms of home renovation, we found this home. It was rotten and infested and good for nothing. It was filthy rags and totally worthless. So we put a torch to it. And we burned it down to charcoal. Then we burned the ashes. And we made the ground level. And then we planted the cross. And then something entirely new came up in its place. It's not a re redo. God is not in the business of giving out mulligans. He is in the business, though, of bringing new life into dead things. If you want to know who we are, if you want to know who is the church, as I've been going on all morning, it is the gathering of the redeemed, because we were all, at one time, prodigal sons and daughters. Remember this story? The prodigal son takes the inheritance, he runs off, and he squanders it. He goes to Vegas, and he spends it on horses and booze until he hits rock bottom, and then eventually has a moment of conviction and comes home. We know this one, right? Beautiful parable. It's also on my to-do list. The son realizes, I would be better off going home. In whatever state I am received, I would be better off going home. So he goes home. Now remember this, always. What is happening on the father's end of that parable? The father is not up in the house, and news comes and says, oh, by the way, your long-lost son has come. No, the father is at the end of the laneway, as it were. I always picture my grandparents' country house. He's at the end of the laneway by the highway, looking always. Is today the day? When is my son coming? And when the son comes, even from a long way off, the son breaks the horizon. The father doesn't say, well, a little, little closer there, sonny. No, the father picks up his robe. He has to run. And he runs out. He bear hugs the son. And here's the important part, which is why I brought this up. What does he say about the state of that now returned child? That which was dead is now alive. And that which was lost has now been found. Now, if the prodigal, until that moment, is considered dead and lost, what is the state of sinners in the eyes of God? They're dead and lost. But the Father waits and will run out to meet any and all prodigals who come home. And in that moment that he falls upon him, the text says, he bear hugs him and won't let him go. The son is returned, the daughter is returned, the prodigal is returned, not just to where they used to be. They're not just restored to their previous state. They are entirely new. Why? Because they were as good as dead. They were as good as dead. And that is why Jesus here employs this language with Nicodemus, and why we as Christians need to, for whatever it takes, we need to get this back into our regular vernacular. You must be born again. I am a born-again man or woman. I am a born-again and adopted child of God. And I think if we start from that place, then our gospel witness will suddenly find its feet once more. We have a man of the Pharisees. Now, who were the Pharisees? This is what you do when you examine the Bible. You just ask questions. So who were the Pharisees? These are the religious leaders in Israel. 
at the time of Jesus' earthly ministry. There are 73 of them. Well, there's actually about 6,000 across all of, the, all of the land. But in Israel, or in Jerusalem, is what we really want to focus on, there was, so the Pharisees were the, the great teachers of the Old Testament law and uh, of the Old Testament in general. But they were the paragons of righteousness. When we were looking at the Sermon on the Mount, this is Jesus is constantly tearing a strip off these people because they elevated themselves. They said, I'm the most godly among you. And all oh, the people would look at them and go, that's the godly example that I should be like. But they are whitewashed tombs. They look great on the outside. Inside they are, oh, here's, here's beautiful. I didn't, this wasn't even in my notes. What are the, the people who call themselves righteous? They're beautiful on the outside. What are they full of? Dead bones. They are spiritually dead. All appearances to the contrary. So we have, of those 6,000 Pharisees, you have basically what's the Jewish Supreme Court, um, kind of the Jewish Parliament, and that's 73 of the most Pharisaic Pharisees. The best of the best, the most righteous of the righteous. These are men who know the Old Testament probably from memory in huge, huge chunks. I mean, and I mean, they could probably sit down and recite all of Jeremiah to you. They have trained for this from their youth. We have 73 of them. They are the teachers in Israel. And here we have Nicodemus, who Jesus will say, you are the teacher. So we have Pharisees, we have the Pharisees of Pharisees, and right near the apex, we have a guy like Nicodemus. He knows the Bible. He lives the Bible. He would have had one of the most rigorous puritanical lives going. He would be one who tithed mint and cumin, yes? gives like a, has, has six ounces of spice and make sure that a tenth of that goes to God. He would have ensured that he was ritually and, and, and purified at all times, would not have let his eyes look on, say, a woman who was not his wife, would have been very careful about what he ate, what he touched, where he went. Now note this. He is not secure in his knowledge and assurance that he's going to see the kingdom of God. For all of that, Nicodemus has what we could rightfully call the sinner's worry. You go, how, how, how do we know that? First off, he comes to Jesus by night. So just to go, up a, go up a little bit, at John, um, John 2. Let's, let's, let's see what happened the previous day. So Jesus has cleared the temple. And then he finds in the temple, this is at 14, he clears the temple. Um, then he answered, this is John 2.18, right? The Jews come. In John's gospel, these are the non-believing Old Testament Jews. You can also read Pharisee in behind that. They come and they say, give us a sign. Jesus says, I'll give you a sign. I'll tear the temple down and I will rebuild it in three days. So he has already started making enemies of the Pharisees. The Pharisees have already said, that Jesus, that Galilee, and that guy from Nazareth, no, he's going to be trouble. So then what happens that night, at night, where nobody can see him, where he's out of watchful eyes? Nicodemus comes. Now, note this. So Nicodemus is already breaking ranks, as it were. Now he comes and he finds Jesus at night, and look at this at verse 2. He starts with a confession. He says, Rabbi, he calls him a teacher. The teacher in Israel looks at Jesus and says, you are a teacher. This is a term of endearment and respect. You are a rabbi. We know. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. Why? Because he's been, as you look in chapter 2, he, Jesus has been backing up what he's been saying with miracles. And it is one Nicodemus over, at least to some extent, to the point that he comes and he says, I know that you are at the very least a prophet. A powerful prophet. You must be. Because I hear you, and I see the things you do, and I am reminded of all of the prophets that I have known from my childhood. I think of Elisha. I think of the floating axe head. I think of the multiplication of jars of oil for the widow. I think of everything. Just go back through all of those Sunday school stories. I hear you. I see what you have done today in the temple. You must be a prophet. Now, keep in mind, it has been four centuries since we have had a prophet. The last one is Malachi. 
And now for 400 years, it seems, God has been silent. And now the silence has been broken. Which means that for all his studiousness, not even the teacher in Israel has first-hand knowledge of what it is to see a prophet, hear a prophet, or see the prophetic works. But he knows the Old Testament so well that he looks at Jesus and he says, you, have clearly, you are clearly in the line of Isaiah and Jeremiah. So he says, I know, I know that you have come from God because only someone who is with God, who has been tasked by God to come and bring a prophetic message, only they get to do this kind of stuff. Now I want you to pay attention to this. Maybe even underline it if you're comfortable doing that in your Bible. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, answered, I want you to underline the word answered, answered. Did Nicodemus ask a question? I didn't see one here. But Jesus answers him with a question. Just go up to the end of chapter 2 above you. I want to show you this. This is, this is so great. Uh, chapter, chapter 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. This is likely when he comes to Nicodemus' attention. When they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, verse 25, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. This is part of Christ's div divinity. And this is not in a general kind of, oh, I know what people are like. I know generally speaking that, you know, if you yell fire in a crowded room, that people will trample one another to preserve their own life. It's not that kind of general knowledge. No, Jesus, as the second member of the Trinity, looks at you and knows your heart. He knows the thoughts of men. He knows what you are like in your most intimate inner beings. Same here for Nicodemus. So Nicodemus comes and he opens with a general platitude. And, and let us also not be confused. This is only 15 verses. I am sure that this conversation went on for hours. Hours. At least an hour. Right? What we're seeing is the telescoping down of it. But Jesus answered him. So Nicodemus comes and he comes with honeyed words, as a Shakespearean, right? Oh, I know, I know that you come from God. You are power, you're a rabbi. And I believe that something is happening here. And Jesus answers him. He answers the question that he knows is burning in Nicodemus's core. Now look at the answer he gives. Truly, truly, verily, verily, he's doubling down on truth. Right, so whenever you see truly, truly, verily, verily, what Jesus is saying is that what's about to follow is not only true, true, he's doubling down on the truth, but it's also probably something new that you've never heard before. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If that's the answer, what's the question burning in Nicodemus' heart? How do I see the kingdom of God? How do I get into the kingdom of God? How do I make sure I'm in the kingdom? It's this. Where is my peace? Where is my peace? Because I don't feel it. And I don't seem to be able to grab a hold of it. And my every waking hour is filled with following the rigorous prescriptions of the law so that I can someday get into the kingdom. But I don't feel it. I am a sinner. I am distant from God. And the harder I try, it seems the more far away I am. He's got the heart of the prodigal. He's got the heart of the prodigal son, grasping at every possible straw. And so Jesus just cuts right through. He said, let's get right to the heart of the conversation right from the beginning. We're not here to talk about prophecy or God's plan to send prophets to Israel. Let's talk about you. You didn't come here to talk in generalities about Old Testament scripture. You came here because you heard me, you saw what I did, you believe I'm from God, and because you believe those things, you think I have the final piece of the puzzle. You think that I have the inside track. You are a man, Nicodemus, who does everything to get into the kingdom, yet you somehow, in your innermost being, recognize that you're not there, but you see me and you think, I'm missing something. Here's a man, finally, who can tell me what to do when I'm in. Nicodemus comes to this meeting with the wrong mindset. It's all 
what else do I have to do? What else do I have to do? There's a world of faith narratives out there, and they just keep stringing you along with one carrot on a stick after another. It's one more thing. Oh, I have to do this. Oh, that, that didn't bring me peace and reconciliation to God? Or I'll try something else. And you just spend your life fruitlessly grasping after everything except the one saving gospel. Nicodemus wants to know. This is the burning question, and Jesus cuts right to the matter, and he answers him. He says, look, you want to see the kingdom of God. You need to be born again. Okay. Now look at Nicodemus' response, because he's still thinking, what do I have to do? And then he's, he's told, I have to be born again. Well, how do I do that? How do I do that? Nicodemus is probably a senior citizen. His mother has long since returned to the earth. And he says, you know, it's not like I can just crawl back up and be born again. Clearly not. Don't be willfully stupid, Nicodemus. Nicodemus says, how, how, can, how can me or any other man be born again? Are we talking about physical birth? Clearly not. That would be ridiculous. Jesus answered again. All right, let's answer your question. Truly, truly, hang on. I say unto thee, except a man be born, so we're not talking about physical birth. Can you clarify a little bit for us, please, Jesus, here at verse 5. Born again means being what? Born of water and the spirit. Well, thank you, Jesus. That clears that up an awful lot. <laughs> what does he mean by that? Now, pages and pages have been written on this throughout church history. And it usually comes down to this. There's a couple of ways of thinking of it. Maybe you've run into this. <clears throat> Born of water is your first birth. Born of the Spirit is your second birth. No, that makes zero sense. All right? If that was the fact of what it meant to be born again, of what to be, to be born of water and the Spirit, what Jesus would be saying is, all right, Nicodemus, first you have to exist. Have you been born? Physically born? Good. Step one is done. Now you can be born of the Spirit. That's not what he says at all. So it's not your physical birth followed by a spiritual birth. It is not water baptism. Now here I'm about to maybe make some enemies. Here's where we're going to separate the Baptists from everybody else. It is not water baptism, and you will hear this a lot, a lot. You must be born of the water, right? We'll dunk you, and then you're born of the spirit. This leads into something else in theology, which as Baptists we would be absolutely stone cold against. And that is called baptismal regeneration. Right? Regeneration is the making of the dead alive. It's the making of the old new. There are denominations, even Protestant denominations, that believe that this happens at baptism. That you are not saved unless you are baptized. That you are not, in fact, made a new creature unless you are baptized. If you know anybody from an Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic background, they were baptized as infants. Why? To save them. So that if they died at two years old, they were going to heaven. They were saved. And they were saved in that false theology by the water itself. Now, as Baptists, we know that water is just water. It's symbolic. It is a public profession of faith. But baptism, and hear me this morning, because when I was younger, I was super confused on this as well, despite growing up in the Baptist denomination. Baptism is the public profession of what has already happened. When we baptize, and if you want to be baptized, I'll do it. Um, I don't know what, we'll, we'll go down to the river or something, I'll chop a hole in the ice, and it'll be real quick. Well, when we're baptized, we, we were known in the 1600s, here's your Baptist history, we were known as dunkers, the dunkers. We didn't sprinkle, we didn't splash, we took you and we put you down under the water and then we hauled you back up. Why? Because what is happening is a public profession of what has already happened. We have died with Christ, been buried with him, and raised up to what? New life. Because we were dead. You, you're going to see this repeated, this metaphor repeated again and again and again. What you are professing to other people who are standing there watching. And this is why our colonial forefathers would go to the river. They would do this on a lovely spring or summer's day. So that the, everybody going by in their carriages could see, what's going on? Who are those people? What are they doing? What's that all about? 
they would take you down to the river, and that right, and then they would call you, hey, yeah, come on down, you picnickers, come and come on down. They would baptize you in a way that visually demonstrated what had already happened on a spiritual level. I was dead, now I'm alive. I was in the grave, now I am up and walking around for the first time ever. And so a lot of people want to link that powerful metaphor and profession of faith to what Jesus is talking about here. But it can't be, and let me show you why. Because we're in first century Palestine, Palestine rather, and Christian baptism is not a thing. It's not. Christian baptism does not exist because the church is about three years away from being founded. Now, you'll say, John the Baptist. Oh, you're a good Bible reader. I love you. Yes, John the Baptist is at this very same point in time somewhere on the, the Judean wilderness eating locusts and honey and baptizing people in the River Jordan. But the baptism that John is doing is for Israel. And uh, let me just briefly give you this. In the Old Testament, you will find instructions for bringing Gentile people into Israel. They have to be brought into the covenant. We're still thinking Old Testament terms, all right? They have to go through a three-step process. One of those three steps, you are ritually washed. Your sins are ritually taken away with water. You would be actually dunked in a bath. You come up and, hey, you're now a member of the covenant. So when John is baptizing, that's what John is harking back to. He's saying a new covenant is coming. The kingdom is at hand, and you, yes, even you, the most Pharisaic of Jews, need to be baptized into it because you're on the outside. You're outside of the new covenant. You will not be automatically grandfathered in. That's what John's doing, but that's not quite Christian baptism. We won't see that until Acts 2 and on. So it's not water baptism, and it's not natural birth. What we're talking about here, I mean, even if it was, it, it, again, on another level, it can't be because we're not talking about a surface level cleaning. We're talking about a complete, total new birth. So what do we mean by born of the water and the spirit? All right. This is why I also wanted you to put a finger at Ezekiel 36. Keep in mind who Jesus is talking to. He is talking to an expert in the Old Testament. Okay? Now, we are perhaps a little... Not, not quite as, as good as he was, so let me take you to Ezekiel 37. So when Jesus says, let me clarify this for you, Nicodemus, let me give you a couple of hints about what do, I, what do I mean to be born again. Water and spirit, does that ring a bell? It really should. If nowhere else, it should here at Ezekiel 30, uh, sorry, 36, although I do want to look at 37. Ezekiel 30, 36. And uh, not the whole thing, somewhere around verse 22. Now this is the Lord speaking to Israel through Ezekiel. And listen to these words. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel. He's talking about repatriating them, forgiving them, bringing them back. I do this not for your sake, Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, wherever you went, and I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own hand. Here's, here's, here's the high point, verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. Does that ring a bell, Nicodemus? That really should. God himself will cleanse you with water. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. Clean from what? From all your filthiness and from your idols. I will cleanse you. A new heart will I give you, verse 26, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you an flesh of heart, and I will put my spirits, verse 27, within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. What 
is Jesus talking about you must be born of the water and the spirit? He's saying you must be born of God. And in fact, if you go into the Greek language from which our manuscripts are all taken, when Jesus says the new birth, he says you must be born again. This is actually just as well translated, you must be born from above. In other words, Nicodemus comes to Jesus saying, what else do I have to do? And Jesus says, there's nothing you can do. You have to be born from God. God has to cleanse you. God has to renew and put a whole new spirit in you. God has to take that stony dead lump that's in your chest out and put in a living, breathing heart. And by the way, it's for the first time, meaning that your entire life, everything you've done, trying to grasp and climb the stairs and the ladder of success, all your sacrifices to whatever it is you've done in your life, it's all for naught. It's all been for naught. Ouch! The teacher in Israel, the guy who is, if anybody's going to heaven, it's, it's him, is in fact as far from the prize as the most base drunkard and wife beater. His whole life trying to get into the kingdom through legalistic means is for naught. He says, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. Now take a look at, at 37. This also helps clarify what Jesus is talking about, being born of the Spirit and of the current state of even a man like Nicodemus. This is a very, I mean, if you don't know all of Ezekiel, you know the Valley of, of Dead Bones, if I just mention that to you. God gives Ezekiel, and I think maybe he's, he's really, because this dovetails off of chapter 36, he's really now, he's saying, let me give you an illustration of this Ezekiel. What will it be like when I cleanse my people? What will it be like when I put my spirit in them and their hearts beat for the first time? It'll be like this. So we have this vision in verse 37. He gives Ezekiel. It's a field of skeletons, just bones. There's been a massive, it's a charnel house. There's just dead people piled on top of dead people and all their flesh has withered away. They're just skeletons. And then God says to Ezekiel, he says, prophesy over the bones. They start to knit themselves together as he speaks, and if you jump down to verse 8, eventually now we're looking at bodies, not skeletons. Verse 8, and when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. So now Ezekiel is looking not just at a field of skeletons, he's looking at a field of dead bodies. But they're still dead. What can dead men do? Nothing. In fact, I, I had a professor that said dead people can only do one thing, they stink. Like Lazarus, right? What, what, what could Lazarus do to affect his own resurrection? Here's the New Testament. Right? Really? What, I'm sorry, once again, what did Lazarus do to raise himself to new life? Nothing. Nothing he could do, because he was dead. The only thing he could do was stinketh. Yes? So, now we have a field of bodies. The Lord speaks again to Ezekiel. Prophesy unto the wind. Oh, this is so important. Prophesy unto the wind. The Greek word for wind is pneuma. It means wind, breath, spirit. Whenever the New Testament writers talk about the spirit, they use this word, pneuma. Now this is not just the wind, as in it blows the trees and, and scatters the snow and made a three foot drift outside my front door. This is in Hebrew, this is ruach. This is a holy wind. This is the power of God. This is the Holy Spirit we're talking about. It's the Holy Spirit we're talking about. So prophesy unto the Spirit, prophesy, Son of Man, say to the Spirit, come from the four winds, breathe upon these slain, these dead corpses, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. That's you, Nicodemus. When I talk about being born of water, do you think of chapter 36? When I talk about the spirit, do you think about chapter 37? Do you think about David in the Psalms crying out, cleanse me? Give me a new heart? Do you think about all of these echoes? What I'm telling you, Jesus says, this is the verily, verily. 
It's not only true, but it's going to come as a surprise to, yes, even you, the teacher in Israel, because you, like the rest of the Pharisees, think that you understand the word of God. You, in fact, don't. You are the blind leading the blind. So back to chapter 3 of John. That's what we're talking about, water and spirit. What we're talking about is you must be completely regenerated by a work of God that you yourself have no and indeed cannot take any part in. How do we know this? Because he still doesn't get it. He's still thinking in terms of what do I have to do? So mark this at verse 6. Jesus addresses that as well. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. All your works, son of man, Nicodemus, my hearer today, all your works that you think will get you into heaven, your flesh, your works of flesh, all you're going to produce is worldly works. But the kingdom is not of this world, is it? What we're talking about is spiritual. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven. Can you do, let me posit it this way, Nicodemus, my hearers, can you do heavenly works? I regret to inform you that you cannot. Despite what maybe some American TV preachers would have you believe, you cannot do anything heavenly because you're not heavenly, you're flesh. That which is born of flesh is flesh. So all your works and your strivings are flesh, but they don't cut it. You need to be born of the spirit, and when you are, what you will see is a transformation and a person in place now that is a spiritual person, a living person. Nicodemus said, how can these things be? How can these things be? I don't, I don't understand it. He echoes, a, um, he echoes a Puritan writer from the mid-1600s whose name was Thomas Cole, who said this, quote, None but a regenerate person understands the true nature of regeneration. Close quote. You see it in hindsight, don't you? It's only in hindsight that I look back and go, Man, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. It's only by looking back out of where I have been called, out of who I was, out of what I did, out of where I was headed. It's only looking backward that I am so appreciative of where I am now and where I am headed now. You see? You only understand it in the rearview mirror, is what Mr. Cole was saying. And Nicodemus can't quite get his whole head around it because he hasn't been born again. He's close enough to understand Jesus. He's close enough to appreciate Jesus. But knowing Jesus, his name, appreciating him, even maybe say, wow, what a great teacher. What a, what a mighty prophet he must be. Does that save? No. No. Which is why everyone in Islam remains under God's wrath. You'll find Jesus in the Quran. You'll find Jesus even in some kinds of, of Hinduism and Buddhism. There's a world that knows Jesus, that maybe even says, well, yeah, you are a mighty prophet. You are a wise teacher. You are the pinnacle of what humanity should be in terms of actions towards God, in terms of morality. They'll, they'll describe him every way, shape, and form, many of which are actually technically true. But they don't save because you don't know the whole of me, he would tell you. You haven't been born again. Why, why was George Whitfield always pounding this? He was right to tell the woman, because you must be born again. Anything else I would tell you, dear madam, in Boston in the mid-1700s, you, you won't understand until you are born again. All of the benefits that I speak of in Christ, the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, the meeting again of those who have gone on ahead of us, the joining of that cloud of witnesses, all the benefits of Christ, you will not understand, let alone receive, unless you be born again. It all starts here. You must be born again. Charnock, Stephen Charnock, talking about John 3, specifically verse 3 and 5, just said, these words contain the foundation of all practical religion here and happiness hereafter. We're going to continue to look at this next week, and I hope that you'll come back and join us.